Hello, my name is Meg Huang. I'm the Executive Director at the Center for Connected Health Policy. Welcome to today's webinar, Telehealth and Medicaid, a policy webinar series, fall edition. Today's topic will be on data evaluations and stakeholders. Before we begin, a few disclaimers and a couple of friendly reminders. Please note that today's information is only provided for informational purposes, is not to be considered legal advice. CCHP always recommends that you speak with legal counsel if you are interested in a formal legal opinion. Also know that CCHP has no fi relevant financial interest arrangement or affiliation with any organization or commercial products that may be mentioned today. Today's webinar is being recorded and slides will be, the slides presented here will be available as will the recording a few days after the webinar. We also ask that everybody please refrain from making political statements or advertising commercial products or services during the webinar. Again, this is an educational webinar and strictly for informational and educational purposes. A bit of background about CCHP. We were established as a program underneath the Public Health Institute to be a California telehealth policy organization. However, an opportunity to become the federally designated National Telehealth Policy Resource Center came available through a grant from HRSA in 2012. CCHP applied for that, we got it, and we've been serving in that capacity ever since. We also work with a variety of funders and partners on the state and federal level, and we act as an administrator with, for the National Consortium of Telehealth Resource Centers. For those who are unfamiliar with the National Consortium, it is a affiliation of the 14 telehealth resource centers who are underneath the same program as CCHP. There are 12 regional resource centers that cover specific states and two nationals. CCHP is the one on policy and there's one on technology as well. We work collaboratively on joint projects in order to make uh, the most efficient and widest use of our resources. CCHP is also the convener for the California Telehealth Policy Coalition, which is a coalition in California of over 100 statewide and national groups who are interested in advancing telehealth policy in the state. And this is a map of the Telehealth Resource Center. As I said, there are 12 regional telehealth resource centers that cover specific states. So I encourage you to reach out to them if you have questions regarding telehealth. For our series, our next two remaining sessions will be on the following two Fridays. On October 1st, we'll be looking at telehealth and the patients with disabilities. And on October 8th, we'll be looking at permanent policies. So for today's webinar, we're joined by Colorado Medicaid. We have Dr. Tracy Johnson, who is the Medicaid director, and Tamara Keeney, who is a research and analyst manager. But before we get to Colorado, I'm just gonna do a very quick overview on some of the uh, data work and evaluation surveys and stakeholder meetings that other states have been doing during this time. So as you all know, this is probably the most obvious slide in the world. COVID really did change everything, particularly um, in a lot of aspects in how we live our lives and how we receive our healthcare. And one thing in particular, it really changed the landscape for how telehealth is being used. This is a very high level overview of the telehealth policy changes that occurred both on the federal and the state level. As you can see, there's a lot of commonalities that are um, surrounding what was addressed, such as you know, what providers were able to provide services via telehealth, what services would be covered. However, one thing that has also come out of all of this is the need for data, for information on what has telehealth done in providing these services? How effective has it been? What has the utilization been of it? How pa uh, patients really receive telehealth and what has been their, their experience with it? And before the pandemic, that actually was not an area that was studied extensively by Medicaid programs. Now, just this week, the Office of the Inspector General came out with this report regarding um, evaluation and oversight for telehealth for behavioral health in Medicaid. So it was really just on, not on telehealth in general, but on behavioral health where telehealth is used. What they did was they did a survey of 37 states, and what they found were, was that there were qual, um, concerns over quality, fraud, waste, and abuse, and utilization of services when they're provided via telehealth. However, the data gathering by the states really varied in like how their approaches and how they were able to gather data. They also noted that while there was concerns over quality, most state Medicaid programs were not assessing quality at all when they were gathering their data. And only one state actually examined cost savings. And in that in their examination of that, they found that there were cost savings, particularly in like limiting transportation costs. 
And additionally, three states of the 37 survey did not track telehealth use at all. So they weren't even quite sure how much telehealth was being used in their Medicaid program. So before COVID-19, there, as noted by that uh, report by OIG, there were states that were collecting data for actually quite a bit period of time in some cases. For example, Texas, they were required back all the way since the early 2000s to provide with their legislature you know, utilization data on telehealth and how much was being used in the Medicaid program. So there were examples of states who have been doing this for a while, but a lot of that did center around utilization, not necessarily on the quality or the cost aspects of telehealth. So now what has happened, we've like experienced COVID, telehealth has had wider utilization for a variety of things in like of many of the states. So the questions do arise in, what has been the impact of it? How many people have been using it? What has been the quality of it? What's been the cost of it? So we're seeing like a lot of states now really focus in and dig in and examine how are we gonna gather this data that we really wanna know about on, the, on telehealth? So they're using a variety of means to do that. They're using surveys and reports. They're using advisory groups and stakeholder engagement to like assess that quality and also that patient experience. And they're obviously pulling data from claims to track how much utilization there were. There's also some you know, issues that Medicaid programs have encountered. So for example, when COVID began, states and the federal government, they really had to pivot very quickly in order to like allow for greater utilization of, of telehealth. So some state systems may not have been able to make adjustments into their system to be better, to be able to attract some of that telehealth use or to track the expansion of telehealth that they were using. So because the states were more concerned in like getting services out there, they weren't necessarily concerned with like figuring out how we're gonna gather data. A couple of months into it, when things have settled down, they're, they kind of are a little bit in a better place and a little bit you know, freed up to like really try to assess that. They're trying to now figure out like what's the best way of capturing that data. But for some states, at least in those couple, first couple of months of COVID, that data is probably lost at this point. So I'm gonna go through two um, examples of like how states have like gathered data. And these are actually examples from previous webinars that CCHP has held in our Medicaid webinar series. And the first one is from California, from Renee Malo, who actually did this in our spring webinar series. And what they're looking at has been really looking at that utilization data that they foresee. So this, this full PowerPoint is actually available on the CCHP website. And you can also hear Renee's presentation. Again, it's what our spring series and it was the one on seniors if you're interested in listening to her full presentation and looking at her full PowerPoint. So they were looking at telehealth visits and California did have a way of tracking it because they were using modifiers in order to identify if the visit was done via telehealth. So they included in her data for phone and video care um, visits. And also um, they were looking at outpatient visits and fee for service or managed care. And what they found was that, you know, over obviously the use of telehealth increased with the beginning of COVID, as you saw, the highest point was in April. That was that really tracks with like when you know COVID really hit and when telehealth became widely available. Um, and just want to also stress that this was very preliminary data. This is going up through um, the end of the year. Uh, so it's not even the 2021 data as, as of yet either. Um, by they breaking it down in the demographics by um, sex, females tend to, to use telehealth visits, at least here in the data that they had, more than males did. They also looked at by age, and it was really more of that adult category of 18 through 64 rather than seniors, even though the second place one were the under 18 crowd. So younger children or uh, younger people were using it as well, but really sort of like the bulk of it was that adult category of 18 through 64. And then by race and ethnicity, there was like not too much. I mean, there was a little bit of a sort of levelness here of like different ethnic groups who are using it. Um, Asian Pacific Islanders were the lowest category if you discount like the the unknown or the other. Um, but uh, white, the whites were the ones who have used it the most. There has been concerns that maybe telehealth may be creating some disparities among some of the ethnic groups here. Um, so they did show to be using it a little bit less than whites, at least with the data from this preliminary data from California Medicaid, um, but they weren't too far off there. 
location, um, by location telehealth visits that were new, um, we saw like actually more telehealth visits in California Medi Medicaid's data in urban areas rather than the rural, but again, not too much far off. There's probably about a thousand difference there, um, but Frontier was definitely lower and then uh, not applicable, or I'm probably thinking that they're not quite sure what that 6,700 included. And then for um, telehealth system by um, delivery system, uh, there's a significant amount of our of the Medicaid population in California that's in managed care. So it's not quite it's not really surprising that the majority of that is probably in the managed care system. So those were sort of like utilization data that um, California gathered. Now we're going to take a look at again something from the spring webinars series that CCHP did this time for children and youth. And this is from Georgia, who used a series of surveys and engagement with providers and patients in order to gather some data. So again, I just want to say, like, you can listen to um, Catherine Ivey's full presentation. We do have that recorded and also her full PowerPoint as well available on our website. But what they were looking at is they decided to do a, a survey um, back in June of 2020 to look at the efficiency of telehealth during the public health and, you know, what worked, what didn't work, what, what opportunities they may have missed. So their telehealth feedback through the survey was that they really skewed more towards providers rather than members who provided the feedback. Um, there were almost like a thousand providers who responded and then a little over a hundred enrollees, Medicaid enrollees who responded. This is the number of participants broken down a little bit more as far as um, you know, what type of providers responded to. So quite a bit of behavioral health and quite a bit of people did not identify, but those, those who did, they were primarily majorly behavioral health, only one FQHC, and then only three pediatricians and five physicians. So they're, they're still that unknown. You're not quite sure like what they may encompass, but there was at least a significant portion of behavioral health providers who responded. So some of the comments that they received, the 101 providers out of 910 submitted comments as opposed to just doing the, the, the uh, multiple choice types of um, choice uh, selection there. Um, 35 members, parents and givers also uh, provided comments as well. And, and basically, um, you know, the comments range from, you know, they enjoyed and appreciate the services to some who were more specific as saying like, you know, they didn't meet the needs of my child, their healthcare needs. So some of their takeaways that they had was that telehealth is a useful tool when applied correctly. Each specialty and service will be needed to be reviewed, to determine whether it's best interest of member to really receive the service there. And also they needed to establish or refine protocols for like providing telehealth. And those around like, you know, HIPAA requirements, certain services that perhaps should not be provided via telehealth, and also the ability of whether, you know, a provider or a patient would be able to like utilize telehealth and participate in it because they may encounter other issues such as not having broadband connectivity. So a couple of other things. So these are pieces of legislation or other activities that are going on now. So states have been introducing legislative bills around data evaluation. So Nevada, Maryland, Minnesota each have have um, issued or had legislation regarding these areas of like gathering additional information. So for example, Maryland's requiring a report on the impact of providing telehealth services, and they are looking at both audio only and live video. And that's a really important thing to note. Like there's a lot of questions around like, you know, audio only, its efficacy, and also how much of that to keep around as well. Convenings that are out there, there are a couple of states that are talking about having stakeholder convenings. Um, Arizona uh, is uh, talking about a telehealth advisory committee on telehealth best practices, and California um, is having a stakeholder convening to talk about proposals for the following year to take place to go into effect on the year 2023. So there's that outreach to stakeholders as well, which actually has not really happened before the pandemic a lot. Usually Medicaid policies have not really engaged a lot of times with stakeholders to get their feedback on how they should shape their telehealth policies. Not all Medicaid programs, but a lot of them hadn't really done that a whole lot or they've, they've maybe gotten stakeholder engagement, but then they haven't really done anything for a couple of years. So this has been also a nice change as well. And Vermont Medicaid actually had like a really early convening to look at that audio only one specifically, and they've already issued a report and that hyperlink is there in the slide. And then um, existing state groups and surveys that are going on. So we have um, 
a main advisory group. We have the Texas E Advisory Committee, which has actually, I think, been around for quite a while because Texas has been like, they've done this sort of like data examination of telehealth for a couple of years now. And then a, a Washington DC telemedicine program evaluation survey too. So these are just some of the things that are going on in other states. I'm now gonna switch this over to Colorado who will give us like more about what they are doing in their state. And we are very lucky to have with us today, Dr. Tracy Johnson, who brings more than 20 years of experience in health policy and program development, research and evaluation. Dr. Johnson currently serves as the state of Colorado Medicaid director in the Department of Healthcare Policy and Financing. Previously, she was with the Denver Health and Hospital Authority where she served as DHAA's director of healthcare reform initiatives. She led Denver Health's implementation of federal healthcare reform, specifically in the areas of delivery system and payment reform. Prior to that, she served as principal of her own health policy consulting firm and in state government. Throughout these roles, she has directed numerous research and consulting projects across the population health spectrum, health insurance coverage, population segmentation slash data anal analytics, delivery system design, health system financing and payment models, safety net provider issues, and health equity. Dr. Johnson holds a PhD in health policy and management for the John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health and an MA in biomedical ethics from the University of Virginia. She's joined by Tamar, Tamara Keeney, who is the research and analyst manager at the Colorado Department of Healthcare Policy and Financing. In this role, she manages a team of analysts to bring the best available data and evidence-based research to Colorado Medicaid policies and programs. She holds a master's of public affairs from the University of Texas at Austin's LBJ School of Public Affairs. Prior to coming to the department, Tamara spent five years as a policy analyst at the Colorado Health Institute. And we are extremely lucky to have them both to talk about the work that they're doing in Colorado right now. So I will turn it over to you ladies. Great, thank you so much for having us here today. Um, as May mentioned, my name is Tamara Keeney. I'm the research and analysis manager here at Healthcare Policy and Financing, which we lovingly refer to as HICPUF. And so if you hear us use that term throughout the presentation, that's what that refers to. And I see everyone talking about the weather in the chat. And so I will say it's a beautiful fall day here in Colorado, uh, but we're here and excited to be talking about um, the evaluation that we conducted in-house at the department last year. Um, so if we go to the next slide, a few things that we'll be touching on in the next 30-ish minutes that we have together today. So first I'll be sharing an evaluation that my team and I conducted to really get to that question of what do we know about telemedicine expansion in Colorado and the Colorado Medicaid. So this came out late last winter um, and there's a link to the full evaluation at the end of our slide deck. But for today's conversation, I'm gonna do a few things. First, I wanna highlight some key findings from that evaluation, specifically to talk about who's using telemedicine and which services are being used. And then I also want to explore a bit how changes in telemedicine utilization have impacted emergency department visits. Then I will turn it over to Tracy, who will talk in about an evaluation. Um, the department contracted the University of Colorado's Farley Health Policy Center to conduct on no-show rates during the pandemic and how the expansion of telemedicine impacted those rates. And then Tracy will also talk about current work on what we're calling e-health entities. Next slide. So before we dive into all of that, just wanted to give a quick reminder of some of the big changes in telemedicine policy in Colorado Medicaid. And May touched on some of these in her opening remarks. So it became really clear early on that additional flexibilities would be needed to respond to the pandemic. And so HICPUF made these changes first in rule, and then they were codified into legislation in July of 2020 through a bill that was called Senate Bill 212. And that bill does a number of things. Um, three of them I wanna to touch on in this slide. So first, as you all are probably aware, before the pandemic, uh, most states in Colorado, this was the case, the only modality that was allowable was audio visual or video, and that changed to allow audio only and live chat in some services during the pandemic period. When it comes to provider type, federally qualified health centers, rural health clinics, and Indian health services previously could not bill a separate encounter for telemedicine. That changed um, with Senate Bill 212. 
And finally, one thing that did not change that I want to note is payment parity. So prior to the pandemic, um, we had it in rule that in-person needed to be paid the same as telemedicine. And that is something um, that we've maintained here in Colorado. Next slide. So with those changes in place, we were interested in knowing how utilization, access, and quality of care were impacted. And so we wanted to evaluate those impacts to inform um, future policy changes in the short term, so during the public health emergency, and then also looking to changes that we might keep in place after the public health emergency is hopefully over shortly. Um, so we did a few things uh, methods wise. We analyzed a fee for service telemedicine utilization dashboard that I'll show you in a minute. We also created an emergency department dashboard, and I have to give all of the credit to our amazing data team who were able to put those together really quickly at the beginning of the pandemic, and that allowed us to track how things were going over time. We also fielded and analyzed a survey of our members. We interviewed providers, we conducted a literature review, and we contracted some of the work out to um, an evaluator outside of the department to do additional work um, both on the lit review and the provider interviews. So again, this, um, this slide deck will cover just a small portion of those findings, and you can find all of the findings in the link at the end. And the report we conducted was through, the data is through August 22nd, 2020, but the data that I'm showing you today is actually updated through March 14th, 2021. Um, and in some cases, I'll show you data that's beyond that even further. So um, we haven't put this out publicly yet, and I've just been doing it in presentations. So it's kind of exciting to show some newer data. So next slide. Um, so we'll dive in now looking at who used telemedicine, which services were accessed, and then I want to look specifically at adults versus children because there are some pretty big and important differences there. If you'd like to go to the next slide, thanks. Um, so this is a screenshot of what our Tableau dashboard looks like. And so you can see we've had our data team build out for us in orange, those are telemedicine services. And in blue, those are um, telemedicine eligible services. So the distinction there is for our denominator, we, weren't, we aren't looking at all services that Colorado Medicaid reimburses for. We're actually just looking at services that are eligible for telemedicine. So a really easy example is something like private duty nursing, you know, where a, a, a member needs someone to come into their home and do a hands-on service. That's not something that's allowable or doable over telemedicine, so it's not counted in those blue bars. So the blue bars, again, are showing those telemedicine eligible services being delivered in person. Orange is showing telemedicine. And we're able to look at things like what eligibility category was the member in, what age group were they in, what was their primary diagnosis, and we're able to look at that over time. Um, and this is actually something that that Senate Bill 212 that I mentioned earlier had us um, do in the legislation. So there's actually a requirement that every other month we post utilization data to our website. Um, so on a bi-monthly basis, you're able to go to that link and see updated information from this slide deck. So with that, if we go to the next slide, I'll actually show you what we found over time. So here we are looking at fee-for-service visits um, conducted via telemedicine. So again, this is the percent of those eligible visits that were conducted over telemedicine from March 8th, 2020 through March 14th, 2021. And we'll also note that this is mostly physical health services. So the way that we pay for physical health versus behavioral health in Colorado is that most of our physical health services are under a fee-for-service basis. The majority of our behavioral health is under a capitation. Um, but due to some of the ways that providers bill for behavioral health services um, in telemedicine, you'll see some behavioral health here. But I would say the majority of this is physical health. And I think the pattern that you're seeing here is not too surprising. So um, again, in March of 2020, seemingly overnight, we saw this rapid expansion of telemedicine, which hit a high point of about one third of visits. Um, that was the week of April 12th, 2020. You see that it went down to about 15% of visits um, throughout that summer, but then we saw another increase in our telemedicine proportion during that COVID second wave in December of last year. 
you go to the next slide. We then decided to look at the data um, for children versus adults, because just looking at the data, we immediately saw some pretty big differences. So I'll do a slide on kids and then a slide on adults. So here we're looking at members up to age 21. And when you look at just the percent of visits being delivered via telemedicine, children are high utilizers of telemedicine and particularly young children up to age nine. And this is because they're more likely to use repeat services. So as you can see here, the average visit per utilizer for children was 7.7. .7. So among kids who had a telemedicine visit, their average number of visits was 7.7 .7 compared to about three for adults. And so when we look at why that is, it's because we see that kids are largely utilizing telemedicine for things like physical, speech, and occupational therapy. So these are services that they might be receiving weekly or potentially more than once a week. So it would make sense that they have a high visit per utilizer count and a high proportion of those visits are being conducted via telemedicine. The chart on the bottom um, reflects that and you can see that pretty clearly and it shows diagnoses in two different ways. So on the left hand side of the chart in that first column, these are the top diagnoses associated with tele telemedicine visits for kids just by the pure total number of visits. And here's where you see those diagnoses associated with the therapies that I mentioned. So you see the number one reason, uh, mixed expressive receptive language disorder, you see autism spectrum disorder. Again, these are diagnoses we, we would associate with physical speech occupational therapy. On the right-hand side of the chart, you see that I've taken the top telemedicine diagnoses by unique utilizer count. And you do still see um, the number one reason, mixed expressive receptive language disorder, but then you see um, two other things come up that we didn't see before. So contact with and exposure to viral communicable disease and acute upper respiratory infection. And this is an area that we started to look at and dig in over time. And so I've been interested in looking at different time points throughout the pandemic and trying to see were there services that may have been delivered via telemedicine at the beginning of the pandemic, and then maybe we saw those stop. Um, and, and that's my attempt at really to try to answer this big question we're seeing around quality. And so I'm interested in seeing if there were services that maybe were tried out via telemedicine, um, and maybe they didn't work out or they weren't, um, once it was a little safer to get back in person, those might've been services that were a priority to get in person. And so that's something that will be coming with our next evaluation. We can go to the next slide and look at adults. So same slide set up, but this time just for adults. See that utilization is a lot more mixed. Um, and so before, if you remember that number of average visits per utilizer was 7.7 .7 for kids, here it's half at 3.1 visits per utilizer. So these adults aren't um, necessarily having the same kind of visits with, re with a repeat cadence. Um, there are more who have just one visit and then they don't have another visit. Um, so what we see in the chart below, again, it's that same chart looking at visit count and looking at utilizer count, you really see a mix of chronic disease management and behavioral health. And so we were really struck when we saw opioid dependence as the number one diagnosis for telemedicine in adults when we look at it by visit count. And that's really medication assisted treatment. So again, those are repeat visits. Someone might be having one or two visits a week and that's happening over telemedicine. When we look at the diagnoses by utilizer count, we see the number one diagnosis reason is hypertension. And we see at number five, type two diabetes. So here an example of how telemedicine is being used for chronic disease management. On the next slide, um, I just have a few pullouts on older adults. And so I know this has been a big conversation of how um, telemedicine is used their older adult population. And so here I looked at ages 60 plus and saw they were the least likely age group to utilize telemedicine in our data set. So as I mentioned, we saw that line um, of overall utilization at around 15%. And when we look at just the 60 plus population, we're seeing only around 7% of those visits are happening via telemedicine. So they aren't as high utilizers as other age groups. Their most common visit reasons were hypertension, diabetes, COPD, and chronic pain. 
And when we've talked to providers and have done literature reviews, we've found that there's been a high reliance on phone only. And um, one provider I, I spoke to talked about potential improvements to video technology. I think Tamara's connection may during the pandemic and sometimes oh, we'll say we yes and then they'll say great um that's uh the same way that we can talk and so um I just thought that was kind of a clever way to to make the connection there if you go to the next slide just the last slide I have on utilization before we go to ED so here um we're looking at urban versus rural and this specific example is looking at federally qualified health centers so Again, the blue bars are in-person visits and the orange bars are telemedicine visits. The first row that you see are rural federally qualified health centers and urban federally qualified health centers are right below that. And the numbers are a bit small, so I'll read them to you. But at the end of um, July in 2021, about 6% of visits were being conducted via telemedicine in rural FQHCs and that was compared to about 15% of visits in urban FQHCs. And this is something we've seen throughout the pandemic that uptake of telemedicine has been higher in urban areas compared to rural areas. And with that, we really um, are looking at things like broadband and internet connectivity. You know, Colorado is a pretty rural state outside of the front range area. And so that's a big concern for us here. You can also see we have rural health clinics and Indian health services on here also with very low rates of telemedicine uptake. So we go to the next slide. I have um, some slides to show you on emergency department use. So we were interested in knowing if increased access to telemedicine would impact emergency department utilization. So first I'm just gonna show you what ED utilization has looked like over time. So we'll start in 2019 and the way these slides are set up is that they're all looking at the month of April. So this is April 2019 trends. This is ED visits per 1,000 members. And here we see, not too surprising, pregnant adults um, and our members who fall into the non-citizen emergency services categories having the highest rates of ED utilization. If we go to the next slide, we sort of just build on each other. This is April of 2020. So this is really the height of the pandemic. Um, and not surprisingly, you saw this huge drop off across the board, across all categories. Um, if we look at children in, in particular, you see that ED utilization dropped 70% from April 2019 to April 2020. And we know there are a lot of reasons why ED visits uh, decreased during the pandemic, particularly the first few months. So first, fear of visiting the ED and being exposed to the virus. Um, increased social distancing and masking. Fewer people were swapping illnesses, uh, kids weren't in school or daycare, and people just weren't out doing the things people do that can result in ED visits. So fewer people on the roads means fewer car accidents, for example. Um, and in two slides, I'll actually show you some of these changes. We've looked at this by um, diagnosis reason. But first I wanna show you 2021, this is interesting. Here's April 2021, that last set of bars that just came in. You see that we're up from 2020. So ED utilization um, in most cases is starting um, to climb again, but it hadn't reached the same level as it was in April 2019. If we go to the next slide, we'll get into some of the reasons why folks are using the ED. And there's a lot going on in this slide, so I want to walk you through it. So this link, this list is ranked using the top diagnoses based on what percentage of overall ED visits that diagnosis category was. So for example, abdominal pain was about 8% of all visits in 2019, 7.5% of all visits in 2020. But you can see that the total number of visits in that count column dropped quite a bit. That makes sense though, right? Because total ED visits um, also dropped over time. So it's possible to see a decrease in the total number of visits, but for the ranking to actually increase. And so some things here I think are interesting. We're looking at the time period of March 15th, 2019 to March 14th, 2020. So that's 
we'll call that pre-pandemic in the first column. And in the second column, we're looking at March 15th, 2020 to March 14th, 2021. So we'll call that the pandemic. Again, you see abdominal pain was the number one reason that folks visited the ED. But on this next slide, if we go one slide ahead, I've pointed out some of the things that I think are interesting uh, in terms of changes. So nonspecific chest pain went from the number five most common reason to the second most common reason um, for folks to visit the ED. And that makes sense, right? When we think about during those early days of the pandemic, um, even a little bit into the pandemic, just the fear around visiting the ED and this idea that folks were really only going if they felt something was a true emergency. Um, upper respiratory infection and lower respiratory infection. So those previously were number two and number three in terms of reasons. You see those fell to number seven and number eight. And then finally, one thing I want to note I've highlighted here in the second column, we see alcohol related disorders climb from not being in the top 10 reason at all, being the fifth most common diagnosis. Um, alcohol related admissions were actually one of the few diagnoses groups that saw an increase in the actual raw number of visits rather than just an increase in ranking. And I think this is a conversation lots of folks are having about the behavioral health needs of members during the pandemic on some of the substance use needs and seeing how that has changed over time. Next slide. So this, this is all really interesting enough. Like I like looking at data, it's fun to look at ED data, um, but where does telemedicine come into this? So as I mentioned, we were interested in investigating if there were instances where there seemed to be a substitution effect. So were there places where ED visits were actually being replaced by telemedicine? And if that was happening, could we potentially use the pr promotion of telemedicine for um, appropriate visits going forward as a way to cut down on unnecessary ED use? So we're sp still continuing to study this, but we've looked at one example. And so it's on this slide here, we have number of ED visits for acute pediatric upper respiratory infection. The first bar um, we're looking, you can think of this again as pre-pandemic and the second bar the same time period a year later. Um, pandemic. And of course, you see really sharp decline um, in the number of visits to the ED for acute upper respiratory infection. If you go to the next slide, I've sort of imagined what that gap could be. So I've mentioned these before. Is it that there was a fear of exposure to COVID during ED visits? Maybe child had an acute upper respiratory infection. Um, parent said, we're not going to the ED. And then the question is, did that visit happen somewhere else? Did it happen in um, telemedicine, for example? Um, or were there just fewer cases? Kids were out of school and daycare, social distancing was going on, masking was happening. Maybe there were just fewer kids who had upper respiratory infection. So that could be what's going on in that gap there. If you go to the next slide, we've been able to identify telemedicine visits for acute pediatric upper respiratory infection in our data. So we know that there were about 5,200 telemedicine visits for upper respiratory infections in kids in that post period, in that pandemic period. And we don't have a way to know if these are members who would have gone to the ED in the pre-pandemic period or if these are members who would have gone to see a PCP in person, but we do know that that means there were 5,200 visits um, that were not seen in the ED and that were seen in telemedicine. And so that's something we're really interested um, in looking at further and trying to understand where some of that substitution was taking place. Again, so that um, going forward, we can try to route those appropriate visits from the ED to telemedicine, again, if it's appropriate. So that's what I have for you. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Tracy to talk about no-show rates. Great. Before we do that, uh, I think I'll just kind of address a couple answer uh, questions in the question and answer. There's one I think I accidentally deleted that was asking about why do we um, permit and, and have so much audio-only telemedicine in Colorado, and is that really a provider-driven thing or a member-driven thing? And, and honestly, it's sort of both and infrastructure. So Tamara kind of touched on all of these things in her comments. 
you know, we have areas of Colorado that really don't have very good broadband access at all, um, like none, um, and other places where it's not very high quality. And so supporting video um, over broadband is just not possible in areas of our state. It's also, um, particularly when, you know, people had to switch in literally a matter of weeks from in-person care to telemedicine, um, most people had telephone infrastructure and not everybody had telemedicine infrastructure um, via audio. Um, even in places uh, that had audio, we didn't have all providers trained. So um, it's just a combination of member preference, provider uh, comfort and preference, and just actual infrastructure there. Um, in terms of you know, knowing how many of our older folks are dual eligibles, that's actually possible to do with our dashboards. Um, I don't have that number in my head. I don't know if that's something Tamara can look at, but we can um, slice and dice our dashboards by eligibility groups. So that would be a way we could get at that. Um, there's a question about remote patient monitoring and really we kind of uh, consider that separate policy. Um, we, um, I think, are, are somewhat behind other states in terms of uh, really sort of leaning into remote patient monitoring here. So that's sort of out of scope for this particular um, uh, presentation, and, and it's handled differently in our policies. Uh, finally, uh, rural versus urban rates are interesting, given that you know rural uh, telemedicine is often touted as a vital tool for rural access. Um, yeah, we were really interested in that, particularly as it pertains to rural health centers, which is also part of the question. And in fact, we commissioned a, a separate study to really lean into why our rural health center take up not really as high as we might expect, particularly given, you know, we do have some take up for our um, rural um, federally qualified health centers. And so they, they share that rural piece and they, and they share um, some, some similarities in the population we serve. And um, what we've been able to gather largely through interviews are, there's a variety of reasons. Um, you know, I already, I already talked about the broadband issue, but you know, that should affect both kinds of providers. Um, rural health centers compared to federally qualified health centers see more Medicare. And because Medicare and Medicaid policy has not been aligned, um, that's sort of been a barrier because you know, a lot of practices, um, you know, if they're gonna adopt any kind of, um, way of practicing, they like to apply it to all of their patient population. And so um, even though Medicaid made our policies permanent um, relatively early, like June 2022, all of our pandemic only policies um, nearly became permanent policies. So, um, but it's just that sort of uh, less clarity on the Medicare side that has been cited as a barrier. Um, the other thing is just sort of the practicing preferences of uh, the provider community at rural um, health centers being um, just sort of culturally preferring in-person um, care. And then finally, the other thing that was cited is, um, you know, rural health centers are connected to rural hospitals and sometimes uh, um, decisions about technology um, are not really made local to the rural health center, but are actually housed at the hospital. And whereas federally qualified health centers, you know, sometimes even the rural um, sites are affiliated with a, um, a network of federally qualified health centers that has their own um, administrative infrastructure. And so just sort of the um, administrative support is, is different for those two different kinds of entities. Um, Tamara, I invite you to just answer in writing to any of the questions that I haven't fully addressed. Um, and thank you, Tamara. Uh, you can see I'm, I'm very lucky to have um, such talented uh, analytics uh, internal. And what I'm gonna present to you now is uh, another commission studied. We, we worked with some partners at the University of Colorado on something we were interested in pursuing because we heard so much about providers being very pleasantly surprised at, um, at, at sort of an unintended consequence of moving to telemedicine is that patients were more likely to be able to keep their appointments. Um, I, I worked previously in a safety net clinic uh, infrastructure and you know, no-show rates, which is sort of the, you know, uh, clinical way we refer to it when a, when a patient schedules but is not able to an, attend an appointment and does not cancel, they just no-show, um, was very common um, in the 
safety net delivery system I worked in and is very common across safety net systems and is, you know, um, you know, remarked on in the literature. And we were just sort of hearing spontaneously that across a variety of different provider types and visit types that people were saying, you know, people can make telemedicine appointments. And so we wanted to get an understanding uh, of that because it has both patient access, member access implications. It also has, um, you know, provider efficiency implications. And of course it has a total utilization implication. So uh, we, uh, again, worked with some colleagues at the University of Colorado to really sort of lean in there. Next slide, please. Uh, so what we wanted to know is, were all of these anecdotal reports actually quantifiable? Did access increase? Um, and was utilization of telemedicine um, a factor in um, reducing no-show rates? And, you know, was it any different across different populations? And uh, so we worked uh, with Denver Health, which is a large uh, safety net delivery system. Um, they actually shared with us information from their appointment system, their scheduling system, as well as their EHR data um, to do this analysis. And um, the, the center at the University of Colorado we worked with is called the Farley Health Policy Center. And uh, we had a, um, a state budgeting source of uh, 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 funder for this. It's uh, called our Office of State uh, Budget and Planning. So uh, next slide, please. So what this um, is looking at is um, in-person rates pre-pandemic, uh, post-pandemic, and then telemedicine, um, which is really only um, large enough to kind of quantify post-pandemic. So what we're looking at are sort of no-show rates, and we're looking at them by different race ethnicity groups. So like, let's look at um, non-Hispanic Blacks, which is one of the largest bars in all, of the, in all of the time periods and modalities. And what I'm particularly interested in looking at is the difference in height between um, non-Hispanic Blacks and the other racial groups. You can see in both um, pre and post periods uh, for in-person care, it's, it's dramatically larger, the proportion you know, of, of uh, no-show rates uh, or the, the no-show rate for that population is much higher than the other populations. Um, when you look at telemedicine um, post-pandemic, uh, that, that you know, it is the highest bar as it is in the in-person care, but the differential is much uh, less pronounced. And so we really kind of got excited about this data is this might be a strategy to reach populations that, you know, historically, you know, have been hard to reach and have, um, you know, outcomes that are, that are outliers as well. And so um, in addition to, you know, uh, reducing no-show rates broadly, there was also this differential that was very interesting by race ethnicity. Next slide. Um, and this is a similar kind of analysis, but here, instead of um, looking at the difference by race ethnicity, we're looking at patient complexity. Uh, Denver Health uses a risk stratification system that really um, is a combination of diagnosis and utilization behavior. Um, so tier one is their lowest risk, largely healthy population, and tier four is their most complex population. This is the group that would have multiple chronic conditions, be using multiple uh, medications, and you know, has um, the highest likelihood of um, you know, having multiple hospitalizations and readmissions. And so again, um, for the in-person utilization, pre and post pandemic, um, pretty similar. Um, you know, the, the highest risk groups are um, unfortunately the, the most likely to, um, you know, have this no-show experience. Um, but, you know, if you go to the post period and look at telemedicine utilization, um, you see that for tiers one, two, th and three, um, the no-show rates are, you know, both reduced relative to in-person care. And you, you don't see that sort of um, you know, differential by tier. And um, you do still see it for tier four, but again, that, that differential is reduced if you compare, for example, tier one to tier four. And, and right now, again, I'm looking at the height of the bars and kind of comparing, you know, the difference in the height of the bars. Um, next slide, please. So um, 
the implications of that work before I go to what's written on this slide, I think are several. Um, the, um, the ability to um, strategically reach populations that have historically had poorer outcomes and been harder to reach in some ways are you know, uh, kind of tantalizing. There's also um, this uh, thing we're thinking about from a budgetary perspective, because you know, um, if you're, well, let's take it from the provider perspective uh, first. If you're a provider, you know, um, it, particularly if you're a fee for service provider, you know, if you're able to get more visits in a, in a given day, um, you're able to um, generate more revenue. So there's like a provider efficiency here that's very attractive. And I think that's how we first started hearing about this is the providers were, were, were pleasantly surprised that they could, you know, fill all of their scheduled appointments. Um, on the flip side, from a payer perspective, that those, those additional visits actually mean um, additional utilization, which has budgetary impact. And that's really useful for us as we plan. You know, a lot of what um, we have to do as um, state Medicaid directors is, you know, foresee into the future, you know, what is, what is our budget gonna look like one and two and, and three years from now? And with a phenomenon like telemedicine that's grown so quickly, um, really sort of understanding and projecting you know, how much of this uh, telemedicine is likely to stay in place and where is it likely to grow and how is it likely to grow? This is just use useful information from a budgeting perspective as well. Um, and so um, I'm gonna transition now from, from that research to kind of more of a, a policy discussion around um, our current work. Um, as I said, we've made permanent a lot of our emergency policies. So it's now permanent policy in Colorado to pay a parity um, for telemedicine. It's permanent policy that federally qualified health centers, rural health centers, and um, one other group of community mental health centers, you know, um, are able to <clears throat> uh, bill encounters for telemedicine where they couldn't in the past. And um, so, so all of that policy that Tamara talked about at the beginning of the presentation is now um, permanently in place. One thing we've been um, sort of uh, looking into is the emergence of what we're, we're calling e-health entities. Um, one thing we started to see um, particularly a little bit into the pandemic. So not, you know, March, April timeframe necessarily, but as the, you know, um, as time moved on from that, you know, immediate ramp up early on, what we saw was providers um, reaching out to their own patients, newly adopting uh, telemedicine as a strategy for reaching their patients. But what we started to see over time were entities that specialize in telemedicine coming into Colorado, some of them for the first time, some of them, you know, had been he here, but um, were, you know, newly uh, uh, serving more of our members. And um, in our data, currently, they're sort of indistinguishable, um, you know, a provider that provides telemedicine to their existing po patient population, and, you know, a company that does telemedicine only. And, you um, we really wanted to understand this phenomenon. And, and once we determined that, you know, we really can't uh, distinguish uh, one kind of uh, telemedicine provider from another, we actually sought legislative authority that would allow us to, um, to do that, to, to actually um, identify um, this different class of providers. So a, we could just describe. I mean, if you, if you can't distinguish in your data, then you can't describe. So, so anything else you might wanna do, look at quality, look at utilization, look at impacts to the medical home, which is something that you know, we've invested in for a couple of decades in Colorado. Um, you know, it was just sort of impossible. So, um, so we, we uh, uh, asked for and secured uh, legislative authority to start, to start to look into this. And so next slide, please. And part of our approach is to really, um, you know, figure out what what is this kind of entity. And you know, we've determined that there's um, at least in Colorado kind of a continuum. You know, as I said, you have these brick and mortar clinical entities that are, you know, providing telemedicine um, to their patient population, and it's just really another mode of providing the care that they've always provide uh, provided. At the opposite extreme, you've got um, you know, uh, uh, entities that don't have a brick and mortar uh, clinic or um, health system attached to them, um, they provide only telemedicine services. 
And, and then in the middle, there's lots of uh, combinations. You might have a provider that has contracted with an entity that doesn't have a brick and mortar clinic. You might have a provider that's created um, a division uh, within their entity, like it's very common, you know, in hospitals, for instance, you know, to have a division devoted to telemedicine. And, you know, there are some hospitals in Colorado that, for example, use that division of telemedicine to reach out to rural areas of the state. Um, what are some other models? There are some models where um, a company started largely as a telemedicine focused entity and um, provides some um, services, like they might have an affiliation with a lab um, so that they can get lab data in to um, complement um, the otherwise virtual only kind of experience. And so, Part of where we have been, and this is very sort of current state right now, is, is figuring out, okay, when we're talking about telemedicine uh, uh, entities or e-health e entities, we're very clearly talking about um, the, the group of uh, entities on the far right in this picture, but are we talking about any of the entities in, in the middle picture too? And that's actually very much where we are in, in our thought process. Next slide. And so we've been circulating kind of a draft definition of what an electronic health entity, e-health entity would be. And it's really sort of leaning more toward, you know, the, the right-hand side of that picture, you know, practice that provides services only through telemedicine and does not provide in services, uh, in-person services to Colorado Medicaid members. That's a draft definition. And like I said, it's very much something that's um, being considered right now in Colorado. Next slide, please. In terms of where we'd like to go in the future, um, you know, sort of uh, circling back to, you know, some of our evaluation questions, um, we pay for behavioral health differently in um, Colorado than we do physical health care. So some of our behavioral health data and our policy is sort of, you know, in a different framework. And so, you know, we're interested in, in digging into behavioral health. Um, some of the behavioral health data you saw um, from Tamara are things that are kind of carved out of our behavioral health system. So, for example, early intervention services, um, you know, you saw that data where young kids, you know, had, I forget what it said, like seven or more, you know, visits um, uh, a person, you know, that per person count was relatively high. Some of what we're picking up there is early intervention. Um, uh, we're also interested in these different uh, models of telemedicine, as I was just describing, you know, as we try to figure out what our e-health um, policy should look like going forward. And then some of these race, ethnicity, language um, trends, um, we really want to continue to look at, um, you know, like many states, we're really interested in um, closing health equity gaps and, uh, both sort of understanding where the gaps are, but also what the potential tools are, are really important um, exercise. And, and like I said, we're, we're intrigued by some of these early findings around telemedicine as potentially being one of those tools in the toolbox. Um, and then um, finally, as uh, was teed up in some of the introductory comments, um, you know, really understanding what is the quality of telemedicine services is I think, um, the, the research project for all of us for the next uh, decade or so. Um, it's really so exciting to see um, the different ways telemedicine has been used. And, and um, I personally am quite anxious for the research literature to catch up and, and give us some guidance about, you know, what are the practices that we should be doing more of and which are the practices that are really, you know, were helpful during the pandemic, but maybe, you know, our, our practices that maybe should should go by the wayside. So um, I think we all kind of need to stay tuned on that. Um, and then next slide. I think we're ready for questions and I see some in the uh, Q&A. So um, I'll kind of look at those and Tamara, feel free to jump in on any you've been able to look at while I've been talking. Yeah, um, so I answered, there was a question about um, the bill for the legislation that really started this work on e-health entities. So I put that in the answer. Um, that was House Bill 1256. Uh, Tracy, it looks like there's a few e-health entity questions, if you can take those. Okay. Are you planning, uh, I think I've 
found them. So I'll read it because I don't know if everybody can see. Are you planning to identify your e-health entities uh, uh, via separate designation for use in claims? Yes, we are planning to do that. Um, that's, that's the way we will be able to um, do this analysis I was describing. It's the way that Tamara has done all the analysis to date. Um, does Colorado limit, restrict e-health entities in terms of enrollment, uh, new versus established uh, patient for Medicaid covered individuals? Uh, no, we do not. There's a question um, in here from Tanya Harris, as it relates to behavioral health and more specifically substance use disorder, what role does the platform play in levels in care? Is it utilized or no? And I'm not, I'm not sure I totally follow that question. Tanya, if you wanna um, give a little bit more information in there. Um, as Tracy mentioned, behavioral health is something that we haven't um, been able to dive into as deeply. We're working with our data team because it's all um, under the capitation for the most part and encounter-based. And so it's just a different data set. So that's something um, we'll be looking into. But Tanya, if you wanna um, try asking your question in a slightly different way, I might be able to give some more information. Um, well, we're waiting to see if Tanya can type in more information or if I don't know if there's the ability to let um, her speak. Um, and then uh, any effort to engage caregivers to reduce no-show? Um, again, I don't know if I understand that question fully. Do you understand that? This I'm looking at Michael Mather's question at 1259. Yeah, I'm not sure. Engaging caregivers to reduce no show. Um, I guess if you're thinking about, I can think about telemedicine and, and children no show rates. I, I think that I could see that being a relevant thing here. I think someone else had had put in the chat too while I was speaking um, some of the benefits of having those therapies that I had been talking about um, be conducted over telemedicine. One benefit we've heard is that the parent sort of needs to be intimately involved. If you've got a four-year-old who has to um, log into their appointment and needs help managing it um, throughout the appointment, that's one way to have parents engaged as well. But I'm not so sure I see um, for that question, other ways to engage caregivers. Um, we could go on to Brenda's question, which is what tool um, do you use to audit telemedicine claims? Um, you know, the, the program integrity functions in Medicaid are, are separate from data analytics and Tamara works, you know, with data analytics. Um, so I don't know if you um, are coming at that question from a program integrity perspective, but it looks like May may want to um, chime in there as well. Sorry about that. I was like trying to clean up some of the <laughs> questions here. Which question were you on regarding um, this? I'm looking at the one that came in at 101 from Brenda Castens, which is asking about um, a tool for auditing telemedicine claims. And um, basically my answer is I don't know because I'm guessing that's coming from a, um, a uh -huh. PI um, perspective. But if the question, let's, let's assume the question is direct, directed to Tamara. Tamara, how do you do the research you just showed us? Why don't you like speak to that a little bit? Yeah, um, we are using, really what we're doing is um, in Colorado, providers are using a place of service code to identify if, some, if a visit is telemedicine or not. I would say one downside of the data that we showed you today and the way that we kind of tag visits as telemedicine is it's really hard for us um, to see if a visit is video or audio only. Um, the, there's really not a great incentive. I think there, there is a procedure code for it, but to put audio only, but providers don't really seem to be using it. Um, Brenda, oh, Brenda followed up saying from a PI perspective, um, we actually do, so I'm not sure what, what PI, because it's a separate office in our department is specifically doing, but I've shared 
um, data with them in the past when I've seen things in the data that might seem a little suspect. Um, it really just comes up in my claims review and I assume that they are doing something on their side, but I can't speak to specifically to what program integrity is doing um, on this at the moment. Tracy, I don't know if you have any more information on that. No, I don't have that information. Yeah, um, from what I've heard with other Medicaid programs and what they've done, at least with Medicare, a lot of the, the tools that they use to ensure integrity and make sure that there's there's fraud or if, like fraud has been triggered are some of the things that they, tools that they use for in-person services. So if there have been like, you know, a suspiciously high number of claims for telehealth saying like, well, could they really do that much telehealth in one day, that many claims? Or if there is, you know, a, a certain amount of claims for like a particular patient, it's like there's so many of these claims for just like this one patient. So that's a little bit suspicious. Uh, that's what I've heard some Medicaid programs do. And what OIG is doing is just using the existing sort of like methods that they have to ensure program integrity um, that they do for in-person services and just translating them over to telehealth. Um, Tamara, like mentioned, you know, losing like the, the modifiers and the codes as well, that definitely helps. It definitely helps you track utilization. Um, so that will be definitely help you like flag it to track those incidences where you're seeing like somebody suddenly doing so much telehealth and within like, you know, a short period of time that kind of raises the flag. I think that's probably like one of the biggest sort of like red flags that um, PIs are using to like, you know, track all of this. Um, another question is sort of um, about uh, the telephone platform telehealth platform being used in Colorado. And it seems like there's an assumption um, underlying the question that we have a statewide telehealth platform. Um, that's not the case. Um, providers are um, affiliating, um, choosing their own software for a large part. Um, there is one kind of exception to that. So um, I, uh, it might take me a minute to explain this, but we have our state divided into seven regions and each region is um, you know uh, administered by kind of an entity that looks like a health plan even though you know some of the payments are fee for service um, so let's just call them health plans we call them rays um, there is a ray that has contracted with you know what we're starting to call e-health entities right um, they do telemedicine only services um, and that that um, that telemedicine uh, entity is required by their local Ray to make their platform available to any provider who doesn't want to use their own their own platform. So in that particular region of Colorado, there is like a regional platform that um, providers can electively affiliate with, or they can they can do their own. But that's not um, true across the state. Um, it just is sort of what that that local health plan or what we call Ray um, decided to make available for their region. Um, for no-shows, have practices tried calling patients and flipping them over to a tele telehealth a telephone visit? We actually have some policy around this. Um, I, I will say it at a high level, and then I think I should make it available to you so, you know, you get the technical details. But um, we, uh, we created policy in this area because we didn't want um, providers called calling patients and billing them as, uh, as uh, medical visits uh, of any kind. We, you know, we, we think that a, a visit is something initiated by the patient. And so um, there, um, there is some policy to guide, um, you know, that sort of, you know, switching a in-person visit to a telemedicine visit, but it can happen, but it is an area that there is policy um, created around to create some guardrails and, um, and it is um, monitored. And then clinical nutrition telemedicine claims. Uh, you know, our, our um, policy is more uh, provider specific than it is like the content of the service. So, you know, um, it would really have to do more with like, you know, can an FQHC, for example, build the service you're talking about? You know, can a, um, you know, a, a, a fee-for-service provider type bill, the kind of service you're talking about. Um, 
I'd really, uh, for clinical nutrition telemedicine, I'd really have to kind of get with our subject matter experts to answer your question fully. Yeah, I, I do know I presented at a conference a few weeks ago with a nutritionist from Children's Hospital Colorado. And I know that they were definitely doing, it was specific to kids. They were doing a weight loss program for children over telemedicine. But to Tracy's point, I don't know the exact provider type that they were. Um, and so I think that's something that we'd have to look into a little bit. But I do know that it's, um, it's, it's happening in Colorado, at least at, at Children's. And then uh, the question by Jasmine around um, the same uh, telehealth bills being used in other states. Um, you know, uh, the Medicaid directors are definitely in contact with one another and, and, and telemedicine is a, is a frequent conversation. And so um, I would say that um, there are both similarities and differences across states um, in terms of uh, their telemedicine policies. Uh, I can float a few things that I, I think are different, um, but I bet May has a, a kind of a, a better uh, bird's eye view of all that. The things that I've encountered in my conversation is, you know, um, some states have policies that differ audio versus um, video, and uh, we don't in Colorado, but other states do. Um, I think uh, the other thing I've uh, heard about is that um, we're one of the first looking at e, um, e health entities, um, although several states are quite interested in that area. Um, but we we kind of look to see, you know, well, what have other states done and, and sort of determine that, well, we're sort of on the frontier here. So, um, and then I feel like there was another thing I was going to highlight, um, but maybe I'll just hand it over to Mayo. I think I rattled them off. Yeah, I mean, you really touched upon like the areas that other states are struggling with, and they may take the same approaches as Colorado, or they may take a different approach. I will say, though, it's not always through legislation. So Colorado did go the legislative route, but sometimes they may just do an administrative policy procedure and like have that in their Medicaid program, just issue it by the Medicaid program, because state Medicaid programs are given actually quite a bit of flexibility by the federal government and how they craft their telehealth policies. Just some states decide to like go a legislative route sometimes, but others may decide to go administrative route. Um, Dr. Johnson brings up an excellent point that e-health sort of the entity there, that's a question a lot of Medicaid programs are struggling with because it wasn't something necessarily prevalent before the pandemic in that you had sort of like what I always try to refer to as either the original or classic model of telehealth where a patient goes to a clinic or a doctor's office and they get to do a telehealth interaction that way. The pandemic really like threw that into like a different sort of like landscape here where now they're getting it directly through some sort of provider. And what do you do with when you're a Medicaid program with that? Because you did kind of have that assurance of like, okay, we know that they're getting some telehealth services but they're in a clinic. So we know a, that they're actually receiving it. And there's, you know, safety issues such as like, there's somebody medical personnel there in case some, you know, they need somebody. So what, what do we do now with like the situation with these other entities? So I think probably what you're going to see is Colorado is sort of like the canary in the mine, in the mine shaft there. So they like, we're one of the first ones to do this. So probably a lot of states are going to like look to Colorado. And before the webinar started, I was telling um, Dr. Johnson and Tamara that, you know, in my conversations with other Medicaid programs, Colorado actually does come up a couple of times or, or has come up a couple of times with different states saying, you know, well, they, Colorado's done this. It's all been good. They've just been pointing to them as sort of a model or as an example of, you know, po policies that they may wish to follow. So I would not be surprised if there is some duplication of what Colorado did in other states. Yeah, one of the comments in the uh, Q&A is from Jack um, about reports or reporting on e-health um, entities. Um, there was some discussion about um, this phenomenon. I mean, they didn't call it e-health entities. That's something we made up. But, um, but this kind of uh, provider and, and how we think about them came up in a med pack meeting. Um, I don't know, maybe in the spring. And so, um, so I've seen some things there and uh oh gosh I can't, I'm trying to remember like what I've seen in writing I mean I feel like a lot of it honestly has been this uh ki this kind of format where people are talking about what are they seeing on the ground you know what are the things that are really exciting what are the things that you know they're sort of don't know how they feel about it you know what are the things that they're worried about like I feel like e-health 
um, entities have come up kind of more in that dialogue space on these kinds of webinars. Um, but again, May, I know you all follow the literature very carefully. Is there something you can um, recommend uh, that's talked about this? Yeah, I mean, I, I know which MedPAC report you're talking about. That was something that they flagged, but they actually did not really go into deep detail on. Um, and, and then it could also be using different terminology as well. Probably what terminology, what more people might be familiar with rather than e-health entity is probably direct to consumer. Mm -hmm. So that has been something, you know, even from the beginning stages of the pandemic, it's like, we really need to look at this. There have been um, concerns about direct consumer that predated the pandemic, but it was in the commercial payer side. So there was concern that commercial payers may have been steering patients just to a direct to consumer entity, which they've contracted with and not allowing their network in network providers to utilize telehealth. And then there's always concerns about, you know, continuity of care and like information is being relayed back to like the primary care providers and everything. I would not be surprised if we start seeing some of that, those, those um, policy initiatives before the pandemic dealing with commercial payers starting to appear in like Medicaid programs and in legislation saying like, you can't, you know, of like trying to address that and not steer people so um, solely to like these direct consumer type of entities. But as far as anybody ha doing like a comprehensive study or having some sort of like you know, comprehensive report on this, nothing so far. And, and Jack, I don't know if this is what you're going to, what you were looking for exactly. And I'm doing this publicly now, so I've committed to CCHP. We have been planning for CCHP by the end of the year to release a comprehensive evolution of the policy, telehealth policy landscape during the COVID pandemic to like track like what have been the changes to like really have that basically in one spot because it is a little bit sort of scattered now with like there's a lot of stuff on our website, but it's not pulled together into one report and analyzed for folks. So we're hoping to have that out by the end of the year, beginning of next year. Looks like there are two more e-health questions and then an ED question. So Tracy, do you want to take the e-health ones and then I'll... Okay, why don't you do that? I've been talking. Why don't you take the ED one? Sure. So the question is, um, for the data on ED visits and telemedicine, um, were they mutually exclusive buckets or did some telemedicine visits lead to an ED visit? So for example, the provider recommends taking the child in the ED. If there was overlap, any idea what the percentage was? It's a really good question. Uh, it's sort of complicated. So we did, as part of that no-show um, work that Tracy show, uh, mentioned, as part of that work with the Farley Health Policy Center, they did look at this. They looked at, very specifically though, for Denver Health patients, um, how often a, a telemedicine visit resulted in an ED visit or a primary care visit. I think they looked at it within 30 days, 60 days, 90 days. The problem with trying to use those findings and applying them to what I showed you is what I'm showing is statewide, um, all the providers that we have across the state, and that data was very specific to Denver Health. So what we haven't done is try to do a similar analysis looking at just those, um, looking at the ED visits that I showed statewide because we just don't have the same access to EHR records um, as we do for Denver Health. But what that analysis showed, um, and I think they are tweaking it a bit to look at shorter time frames. Um, was that there is, it does happen, you know, that someone has a telemedicine visit and then they have an ED visit or a primary care visit. But what's tougher to show when you look at it in larger time spans, so looking at was there a primary care visit within 30 days, it's hard to say for sure if that visit was for the same reason as the telemedicine visit. Um, and so I think that's something we would need to, to be able to make that kind of connection. We wouldn't be able to do that data. Looks like a lot of what we're doing right here. Whoa, that's, <laughs> a lot of what we're doing right now is describing um, what's happening so that, you know, sort of the first step in policy, right? Is like, what is happening? And then, you know, deciding is it desirable is not desirable is sometimes uh, a, a second piece. Um, in terms of the, uh, does this bill allow you to practice across state lines? So the, the telemedicine bill was really about creating this separate category of provider and that's it. And so there wasn't really, um, you know, 
like there was a rationale in the bill and the rationale in the bill was because we want to understand, you know, um, how to ensure access, how to ensure, you know, all this is May was just talking about continuity of care, quality, you know, but that, that will all be worked out in regulation at some future date, but really the, the, the bill itself, you know, allowed us to kind of create this separate category of e-health entities. So, um, to the other question about is it for physical health um, only? Yes, it's our well, it's really our fee for service policy, which is predominantly physical health. Okay, I think we have just a comment from Brad Luce. I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your last name. Is direct to consumer is a business model that often this intermediates physicians, dentists, and other healthcare providers. Doctor directed is a model that needs to be seriously considered in telehealth policy to ensure best treatment outcomes for patients. Um, I, I don't think anybody disagrees with that. It is something that needs to be considered and, and looked over and thought about mindfully, like all of these telehealth policy developments. Um, it, it's just something that was not, I think, at the forefront of a lot of people's mind before the pandemic, but it definitely is now. And then the last one is from Tina Snyder. If an established patient goes on vacation to another state, can their provider in Colorado care for them in another state? Um, I'll, I'll take that one or start off at least first. It's gonna depend on the state that they're going to. So some states, especially during the pandemic, they relax their licensing laws, but rule of thumb is if you're in another state, you've gotta be licensed in that state to provide a service to them. So again, we're in a public health emergency. Some states relax those licensing requirements. So they may be able to provide the services, but really the best thing is to check with that medical board or that licensing board in the state that the patient is in just to see exactly what their policies are. We do track some of that, po that policy on our CCHP website, so you can check there, but it is always best to call the medical board just to be absolutely certain on um, you know, what they're doing, just in case, for example, they maybe you know, changed something recently too. I, I think that is it for our Q&A, our questions, um, which was, ladies, you guys were fabulous. I mean, thank you so much for taking like those range of questions, the, the research. Tomorrow, I mean, it's it, incredible the work that you've done. Um, probably everybody wants you in their Medicaid team to look at their data. That was some fabulous work. Dr. Johnson, this is not your first time with us as always stellar um, work and presentation there. So I am just going to share my screen very briefly to wrap us up here. Um, Again, thank you again to Dr. Tracy Johnson, Medicaid Director of Colorado, uh, Medicaid, and Tamara Keeney, who is a Research and Analyst Manager for this, these great presentations and also um, answering those multitude of questions, those wide range of questions that they had for you. Uh, just really quickly, if you are interested in keeping up to date with CCHP information, you can subscribe to the CCHP newsletter um, to get uh, updated information on policy throughout the country and also changes that are going on on our CCHP website. This webinar is being recorded, so the recording will be made available. It will take us a couple of days to get up on website, but just check our video page for webinars a couple of days um, into next week, like maybe on Wednesday or Thursday, and we'll have a copy of the webinar, a recording of the webinar up, as well as a copy of the PowerPoint. Our next webinar is talking about telehealth and patients with disabilities. It's a little bit different than our other webinars. It's not exclusively Medicaid because this is a little bit of a broader topic, but I think very important. There's been a lot of questions, I think, during the pandemic that have raised of like how telehealth is being used to treat patients with disability. We hear from Kentucky and from North Carolina on this. Again, I just wanted to thank everyone. Please note that an evaluation form will be sent to you once this webinar is um, ended. It would really help us out if you could fill that out for us. It provides us with like further information on what topics you might wanna see for future webinars. Um, so that would be very helpful if you just go ahead and do that. And Dr. Johnson, raise your hand. I think she probably wants to maybe address some of the questions that just came into the Q&A. <laughs> I was actually, uh, thank you for doing this because I know you're just trying to wrap up here, but. I uh, was reflecting on one of the earlier questions and I, I did want to um, answer something a little bit more in a technically accurate way. Um, I think someone asked if, you know, the e-health um, entities would be on the claim in some way. And I said, yes, which is true, but like not as a modifier, which may have been what 
the person was asking. What we're really thinking is this is, um, and you know, this is very active policy, so it, it may not go this way, but you know, our current thinking is this is going to be more like a provider type. So it'd be more like, you know, at, at enrollment, you would sort of designate yourself like I am this type of provider. And, um, and so then it would appear on the claim, but that's the way it would get on the claim. So anyway, just in case that was not clear earlier, I did want to correct that. Okay, thank you so much for that clarification. And the two questions that I thought were questions in the Q&A were, were simply thank you for, to you both for like the, the great presentation you guys did. Everyone, thank you to our attendees for being here today and for sticking with us through this. So um, I'm just gonna wish everyone a wonderful day and thank you again for joining us on our webinar and have a great weekend, everyone. Stay safe.